observing Donnie, and I was thinking to myself, Donnie, she gets the utmost joy as she directs. And even if you don't want to sing, you will sing because she's there. She'll make you sing. She'll give you the joy of singing. And that's what it's all about. We want to thank our young men and women. They, every time they minister to us, it's always out of the depths of their spirit and is translated from them to us. And thank God for that. Stella, good to see you this morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to see all of you. As you know, after we have had, uh, after the message and the invitation, uh, we're going to have just a sketch of announcements, our offering. And then I'm hoping that unless it is an emergency, or uh, something out of your control, that we're going to have a congregational 45 minutes of prayer, praying together. Yeah. Now, someone asked, asked, well, asked the question, why is this important? Well, first of all, because scripture admonishes us, commands us, invites us to not only pray singularly, but to come together cooperatively pray together, encourage one another in our praise. And I've always looked at it this way. I would prefer to have met several people to pray with me than to be alone and to go through an emergency and I have to pray by myself. Nothing wrong with that. But other prayers can help encourage, support, and buffet in terms of uh, my spiritual position. So I hope you will stay. Uh, I understand, you know, if you're on meds or something like that, you have to go. God bless you. But we're hoping that you will stay because at the end, we're going to have special prayer for special requests. Amen? Amen. Now, very briefly, would you open your Bible with me to the uh, first book of the Word, book of Genesis. Chapter 37. This message is going to be looking at family concerns, the family, problems in the family, as we um, line that up with problems in our culture today, beginning and the root of it starting within the family structure. Genesis chapter 37. If you have it, say yes. yes. Amen. Could we all stand in respect of the reading of the word? Only just four verses, or really three. I'll be reading from the NIV, New International Version. And it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. Now, this is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhad and the sons of Zippah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, who is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. Let's go and stop at verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Let's end right there. So end of God's word. They hated him. There, there, there is an undercurrent in terms of um, a sin that has been plaguing the family 
over thousands of years, but it looks like it has become maybe more rampant today than in yesteryears. And I won't talk about family concerns, or you can say family matters. It, it, it really doesn't matter. And studying out this text, because when I read those first four verses, it was like a stop sign. I couldn't go any further. Jacob loved one of his sons more than all the rest of those children. And he didn't have about two or three. He had, he had a whole lot of children, 12 of them to be exact. And they knew that, Jake, that Joseph was a favorite. And because he was, they hated him. I want to focus on this destroyer called favoritism. Favoritism, because this attitude invades every family to a greater or to a lesser degree. This fellow, favoritism, if allowed, can poison and literally create chaos, confusion, and disunity in a family. Favoritism can eat at the cohesiveness of family ties and leave behind a wreckage of broken lives. Our text is an example of this kind of sin. We're told by the narrator that Joseph was born to Jacob in his old age. The narrator probably put this statement in for a dramatic effect because Joseph was born in Padam, Iran, when Jacob was in his prime, and he was around 60 years of age. Now to us, this is going into the twilight of life today. We call this the senior citizen era, amen? But we have to understand that the lifespan of the patriarchs in those days was much longer than what it is now. And most of them physically lived past 100 years of age. Now, if anyone was the child of Jacob's old age, it should have been Benjamin. Personally, as I read those verses over and over again and thought about this and then went a couple of chapters backward, I don't think Jacob's favoritism just evolved because of Joseph per se. But Joseph, and let me go back so I can give you a background and we can understand in terms of why that statement was made by Jacob, about Jacob rather. Joseph was the son of Rachel. You remember Rachel? And Jacob literally, the first time that he saw Rachel, he was starstruck. He loved that woman. And scripture says he hated Leah from the beginning. Now, let's go back because this gives us in terms of the attitude now. You remember that in the home of Jacob that there was the same problem, favoritism. Remember his, his mother, Rebecca, she loved him. And his father, Isaac, loved his brother, Esau. You remember the confrontation that ensued, and it erupted, and Rebecca told uh, Jacob, go to my brother, Laban, stay there for a while till this thing cools off. Well, when he went to Laban, that's when he met Rachel, who was one of the daughters of Laban. But he somehow went into a contract with his uncle. And they agreed that he would work seven years to get Rachel. Amen? But after the seven years was over with, old tricky Laban <laughs> deceived his nephew, lied to him. And instead of him getting Rachel, he gave him Leah. Jacob was extremely angry and asked him why. 
And Laban told him that in his family, it was the custom to give away the older daughter first, then Rachel the younger. So he had to work another seven years to get the woman that he really loved. So he worked 14 years to get one woman, and the other woman was just extra baggage, Leah. I mean, you might as well say it. Read, read the narrative. That's basically what it amounts to. All right. Now, Rebecca is dead. Rachel is dead. And the love that Jacob had for Rachel has been transferred to her son, Joseph. He shouldn't have done it. We'll get into that in a few moments. But he did do it. And not only did he maybe inadvertently show his affection to Joseph, but he demonstrated it by making a coat of many colors and giving it to Joseph. And the more Jacob did for that boy, the more the other older boy sons hated him. And Jacob, I don't know whether he was aware of it or not, but all he was doing, he was making his other children alienate this one boy. Now, I'm going to try to condense this because I got about 10 pages that I wrote out. But you don't want to hear no 10 pages, do you? Okay, so let me, <laughs> let me see if, if, I, if, I can give, if I can give the story. Joseph was like in his 17-year-old teenager. Most teenagers are somewhat, how can I say it? They are full of a lot of fun. They don't have a lot of wisdom. They don't have a lot of insight. And usually teenagers they are looking for acceptance from their parents. They are looking for approval in their lives so that it can help them to become mature and complete when they grow up. Amen? Joseph was no different. Okay, so what he did was this. He would go out and he would watch his older brothers and when they were out of the presence of daddy, they would do some things and say some things that they wouldn't have done or said in the presence of Jacob. Joseph would come back and tell his daddy. In other words, he was a tail bearer. He was spying on his brothers. Amen? Now, this was a problem with Joseph because I, I want us to see his character, his daddy's character, and the older brother's character. Now, in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18, it says, Whoever spreads slander is a fool. And then in Psalm 50, 20, it says, You speak continually against your brother and slander your own mother's son. Joseph demonstrated the folly of youth. He was brash, impetuous, proud, but at this point in Joseph's spiritual development, he's not the person he's going to be that we will look at later on down the line when he is elevated by the sovereign God to the throne of Pharaoh. He's not the same person. God is going to transform him on the inside. And that brings up a very great spiritual lesson. What we, you and I are today here, this is not what we're going to be if we live 10 or 20 more years from now. Because there are a lot of things in me and in you God has to break, crush, clean, wipe out, whatever it might be, even though maybe I might feel that I'm in pretty good condition. I'm in pretty good shape. But you see, in the eyes of God, he knows the weaknesses, the flaws. He knows in terms of of everything that our limitations are. 
that he needs to address, to remove, and to put in us that which is stronger, better, and greater. Amen? So don't ever think because you, you've been walking with the Lord for a long time that you're in perfect condition. No, no. It's still a whole lot. All of us got to learn at this juncture. Now, let me, let, let me suggest this, that Joseph felt possibly justified because his father made him this coat. And this coat somewhat gave him a sense of being superior to his brothers because there is a scripture that you will find in, I think it's 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 18, and this is the only place where the Hebrew word occurs, that this coat was a coat that royalty wore. People that were in a leisure class. This wasn't the kind of coat that a working young man would wear being out in the fields. Amen? So, when his older brother saw him with this coat, it also created hostility in their hearts. And they are wondering, you know, well, why is it that, that that younger brother, he gets one of these coats, and then plus, I'm sure that that made Joseph feel a little bit, what, privileged, that he possibly didn't work as much as they did. They were out there in the fields, this sort of thing. So it was creating a big vortex between him and the rest of those young men. Now, when we look at this, we realize that Joseph, in a sense, he was small, yeah. But we can't contribute everything to him because his father, Jacob, also helped to greatly contribute to the problem. Now, you got the background. Is that right? And we see what has been laid. Now, I want to address this problem of favoritism by recommending three principles to combat this sin. Number one, are you listening? And this is to all of us because this message has been smacking, smacking me in the face and kicking me in another place behind for at least about a whole month. Parents, Love your children evenly, not partially. Love your children evenly and not partially. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9, it says in the King James Version, let love be without dissimulation. The word dissimulation literally means to hide under a false appearance. Then the NIV, it gives us a clearer insight. The NIV says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Don't let bias destroy the harmony in your home. Now, I realize that when God gives us children, which are the fruit of the womb that the Bible tells us, that each child has a different personality, a different temperament, they're made up differently, their dispositions. And I understand, because I have four, thank God, that some children are more lovable than others. They are more obedient. And, 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 and it's like a magnet, you just drawn to them. Then you got, forgive me for using this term, then you got the knucklehead in the family, right? Rebellious, tell them to do something, they'll do it when they feel like doing it, then they won't half do it, and then when you uh, approach them about it, then they're gonna, they try to justify why they didn't do what you told them to do. Now, some of you are possibly shaking your heads, but, I cannot believe that in every family there is a knucklehead, a rebellious, disobedient child. I don't, I don't mean something like a prodigal son, but a child is going to do things their way 
when they feel like doing it. Amen? <laughs> Let your love be the same for each child. Spread your love evenly. We are God's children. Amen? Amen. All of us ain't lovable. You might want to say amen because you know it. Some of us are obedient. Some of us are stubborn. But God loves all of us. Does he not? And that's the reason why Jesus Christ came. He, didn't care, he, he did not come to save an ethnic group, a certain racial group, a color. He came to save the world. And in the world, you got all kinds of, it's just like that parable that Jesus gave about throwing the net out and drawing the net in. And, he, and when he brings the net in, not only are there fish in the net, but everything else is in the net. Love your children like God loves you. I didn't say like, because there are a lot of attitudes that is hard to like. But we are commanded as God's people to love what? One another. And that love must begin in the home, not in the church. Because if, if, let, let me say it like this. If there is no love demonstrated in the home, and I come here looking for acceptance and approval, that's going to create a problem in the church. Can't find it. And that's to start at the root of the problem. Let me go on. Some of y'all are giving me that evil eye. But that's all right. You know I'm telling the truth. I said that Joseph had to deal with negative peer pressure. He had to deal with rejection as well as an unhelpful parental pressure. That robe did not help Joseph. And Jacob, maybe he didn't mean to do it, but unintentionally, he destroyed the harmony and the well-being of his family. And you would have thought, among all people, Jacob came out of that same problem. Favoritism. And instead of him stamping it out and saying, well, when I get my children, I'm not going to do what my parents did, he transfers it, and he does it worse than what it was done when he was growing up. Now, let, let, let me speak to the young men and women who are not married, but uh, looking ahead to that and having a family. Before you can love your children a godly way, Make certain that the partner that you marry, you love them in a godly way. The relationship that you have with your partner is going to be transferred to your children, whether you believe it or not, or yes, it will. And then from there, it's just like, it's just like a, a disease. It permeates through the whole family, and it even goes beyond the perimeters of the immediate family to what? To other members in the family. And then, if I'm at home, and if I'm not loved, then I come to the church to find love. And what if I don't find it here? What if I don't find it and I'm not accepted here. Then what I do, I try to find a group of people that will accept me. And many times, that's how people get in trouble, that they make decisions against their better judgment in order to what? 
in order to get the approval of a group that they are seeking to be loved by. Going into drugs, alcohol, whole lot of things. We see it right now here in St. Louis, Missouri. Every weekend, no respect. Young men and women being killed every weekend. I don't mean every now and then. John, I don't know what the count is, but I can imagine the homicide number now here in St. Louis ought to be somewhere close to 200. A hundred and something. And the summer ain't over with. Now, the question has to be asked, and I'm going down this road just briefly, and then I'm coming back to the text. Why? Why? We hear the phrase from some of these young men and women, I'm being disrespected. What are they actually saying? Amen? And actually they're saying, I'm not being loved. I'm not being accepted. And usually within the black community, it's a single parent, and usually it is a female. And usually she has to work, if she's industrious, a couple of jobs in order just to put food on the table and to put clothes on their backs. So she's not able to do in terms of spiritually and in terms of laying certain uh, biblical values in their lives. So what do they do? They go out and they learn the wrong values from the street. Find love or look for love at the wrong place. What can the church do about it? Well, we have to make certain that within the context of our personal families, that we spread the love. Now, when they get grown, I understand you, you, you have to become an advisor then. And that's all you can do. In fact, sometimes when they get grown, you wish when they're making bad decisions that you could somewhat, what, challenge them or maybe if they were younger, you could make them do some things. But when they get grown, all you can do is pray for them. That brings me to my next point. The second principle is constantly put your children and your grandchildren under the covering of prayer. Never give up praying for your children. I know there are times you feel like by the way they demonstrate their lives and sometimes bad decisions. Sometimes I know you feel like it, 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 ain't, it, it ain't getting through, right? And that the praying is not accomplishing anything. But don't give up. You see, you don't know what God is going to do in their lives. You may not be here physically to see with your natural eye, but that doesn't mean that God hasn't heard that prayer. And God commands us to pray for our children and grandchildren. And no matter how frustrated it becomes, you got to leave them in the hands of God. And when you think about it, God doesn't give up on us, does he? No, no. And many times we're contrary. We go the wrong way. There are prodigal sons and daughters all in the land. But God, what, is patient in his sovereignty. He's still loving. And sometimes, like, 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 like my grandma used to say, he'll give us enough rope and let us hang ourselves. And one thing about it, when you hang yourself, you will come back home. Because that far country will destroy you. And folk out there in that far country, they don't love you. All they want to do is use you. Then lastly, Keep the lines of communication. Oh, oh, before we get to that last one. Not only pray for your children, keep them under the cover of prayer, 
pray also for their salvation. It's all right to have a child that's a good citizen, but I much rather have a child that's born again. Lastly, keep the lines of communication open with your children. Now, I realize that there are generational gaps. I understand that. And the language that was used in my generation, in my time, ain't the same language that these young men and women that were singing. Some of the terms that they use, I don't even know what they're talking about. And I guess some of the terms that I use, I guess they are scratching their head. They don't know what I'm talking about. But somewhere, we can bridge it. We can come together. There is a commonality. And you know what that commonality is? In Jesus Christ. Now, I may, I may, I may, I may not be able to talk you know, about all the things that are going on in your world and on your iPod and your, your space cam and, and all this kind of thing, but we can talk about Jesus. Oh, yes. We can talk about Jesus. That's where we have a common, a common ground. And the reason why it is necessary to talk about Jesus, because not only do I, as a parent, need him to give me wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and insight, because I found this out, maybe some of you all are perfect parents, but I found out I was looking one day for a manual for parents. I was looking for a book that will tell me how to be a perfect parent, what to do in certain problems, you know, what steps to follow. But I found out that it, there is no book written, no manual written that can tell you how to be a parent. Most of us, even for those of us here that our children are grown, when we were trying to raise them, Many times it was trial and error, sometimes more error. But thank God for his what? Grace and mercy. And what we did wrong or what we didn't do, God stepped in. And that's the reason why we got to praise him and to thank him. And the same thing goes for our parents. They didn't do everything right. But I tell you one thing, they told me, I don't know about you, they told me how much they love the Lord. They told me how God came into their lives, and they told me that I needed the same God that was in their life to guide my life. Now I realize that many things they told me. Then I said to myself, it don't make sense. They're crazy. They ain't got no sense. And I will do what I want to do. But isn't life strange that what I thought was a crooked stick then, when I look back on it, that stick is just as straight as it can be. They weren't crazy. They had more sense than I understood for them to have. And many times when I talk to my grown children, and I'm relating my past. They can't relate to it. And even though they don't say it, because I hope and pray they respect me, but I can tell it in their eyes. They're thinking in their minds, because I did the same thing. Human nature don't change. I wish daddy would get through talking. He gets on my nerves. He don't know what he's talking about. He don't understand what I'm going through. Maybe I don't, but I do know somebody who does. And I'm recommending you to him. Now, the day is going to come, I won't be here physically, but they're going to look back on what I try to share with them, and oh! They're going to say, Daddy did have a whole lot of sense, didn't he? 
Daddy told me to do this. And they're going to end up doing the same thing, maybe a different way, but they're going to be doing the same thing. And then they're going to realize with their children, you get to have the Lord. Can you raise children without God? And for your own life, you can't, you can't live it without God. In Proverbs 22 and 6, it says what? Train up a child in the way that it should, what? Go, and when that child is old, it won't, what? Depart from it. Now, that's like, that's like a maxim. That's, that's a basic principle, but it doesn't apply to every situation. Because you can instill those, those uh, roots of uh, biblical and eternal values, and yet they might go astray. But one thing I have observed in my life, no matter how far they go away, God has a way of stirring their hearts and bringing them back to his way. So I, I take that scripture and I paraphrase it and I say, start out a child in God's way. Go in God's direction. Teaching them God's word. Because when you think about it, when it's all over with down here, what will be the legacy that you and I are going to leave for our children, our grandchildren? The only thing after they get through with whatever physical articles we got left, and that ain't going to be much because they, they possibly won't want the clothes or they won't be able to wear, so they give them away. They might keep the watches and the rings, something else. But when they get through, the bottom line is they better have Jesus. And really, that's the only thing I can do with my children. And I can share with them what Grandma told me. Well, how, 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 how does that song go? Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me all along this. Hey. Oh, Jesus journey. I want Jesus. There was a time that, that, that I considered that to be foolish conversation. Because I thought to myself, I'm going to do my thing my way. I ain't care what they say. You, you know, I've shared this with you. When I graduated from high school, I was so glad to get away from home. I didn't know what to do. Make my own rules. Make my own regulations. That's what I did. The Lord, well, the Lord, I, 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 I realize it now, but he let me do it for a while. I thought I was doing my thing. And look like, now when I look back on it, it looked like the Lord was looking down on me and said, poor fool, he don't know. He don't know what he's doing. And then when the Lord got tired of me acting crazy, then he started to. And you know how he did it? He did it through circumstances, through people crossing my path, changing this. For in Philippians chapter 2, it says, let this mind be in you what? That was in who? As a man thinketh. And when God starts messing with this, oh yes, it starts going down. It starts going down. And before you know it, he has you in his net of love. And you don't even know how you got there. And it takes you some time, years after that, you start reflecting. And you start taking it step by step. And then you start to realize, oh, okay, that person he brought into my life. He made that a friendship relationship. Oh, I didn't realize 
what they contributed to me. Then you start to see how gracious God was. He could have left me and you out there. He could have left us in a far country. We could have been destroyed because there are a lot of young men and women. In fact, there are a lot of people that are destroyed right now are being destroyed in that far country. Some of them will never return. And not because we were so great and good, not because that we were so what? So obedient and kind that God brought us back. No, no. He did it just because he loved a knucklehead like me. I can't explain it, but I thank him. And the more I think about it, and the more I look at it, Brother Collins, I didn't deserve it. It makes me more humble and grateful in my spirit that God smiled on me. Like the old folks said, I could have been dead, sleeping in my grave. But oh! He! He! There's another song that says, you'll understand it better by and by. And all of us will understand it better by and by. And I'm looking forward to that by and by where I can be released from this mortal step into immortality. And there in his presence, in his glory, I'm just going to look back and say, how did I make it over? Have you ever thought about all of the trials and the wreckage along your life that God spared you, the roadblocks, the ambushes that Satan aimed at you, he shot at you, he used certain things to destroy you, to bring you down, but God, in spite of that, carried you over? And you have figured, and you're resupporting, and you're figuring, you didn't know how you're going to get out of it. But all you could do was just, what, raise your hand and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If you withdraw yourself from me, I ain't got nowhere to go. And you resign yourself to his power, his sovereignty, and his love. And you say, Lord, if you don't do it, I ain't going to make it. And you looked up. And what we call a miracle, but with God, there ain't no miracles. He's just been God. But you see, since I can't understand, I can't understand eternity, and my little pea mind is not strong enough, nor deep enough to fathom the eternity of God, to me it looks like a miracle that he changes nothing into something. He takes a negative, he turns it into a positive. Now to him, he does it all the time. Because when he stepped out on nothing and spoke, then something came into being. I can't do that. Everything that I see, I bring in a world of something. Lord have mercy. The invitation is extended. And the invitation centers around this. Briefly, sin comes in many shapes, forms, and sizes. Our four parents, Adam and Eve, when they fell in the garden, they pass on to us that fallen nature. And what is that fallen nature? I want to do my thing my way. I don't care for God. I don't want him meddling in my life. I know what's best for me. But God says, I'm going to show you what's best for you. I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, and he's going to die for you. I'm not just going to tell you I love you. I'm going to demonstrate my love. I'm going to let my son give up his life for you. And the scripture says, greater love has no man than this, that a man will lay down his life 
And that's what Jesus Christ did. Now, if he laid down his life for us, he doesn't want us to die. His death sealed it. He died one time, and that's it. You don't need to die no more. He wants us to live for him. And you see, when, 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 when he fills you with his Holy Spirit, you don't go around looking to be accepted by folk, wanting to be loved, because you know who loves you. And I'm not saying human relationships are not good. Don't misunderstand me. But you don't hunger for it. Because see, if we, when you hunger for something, you will look in bad and wrong places. And some folk can give you love that you might be looking for. But Jesus Christ, he can, he will. If you yield and surrender your life to him, he will give you a life where you will not be looking for approval from others to define and identify who you are because you know that God has already told you who you are. You are his child. You belong to him. And that's enough. If you're here, as we stand, will you come? The door of the church is open. Whosoever will, let him come.